The combination of highly permanent construction and lack of realism in its conception is one of the worst legacies our time is leaving to posterity. Bjorn Lenn, Learning from Experience, The Use of Building and Planning History, 1978. Mature systems suffocate nascent ones. Thomas Hughes, 1989. Chapter 18, Aging in Place, Aging Sans Grace. 18.1, Managing. As systems transition from growth, see Chapter 10, to maturity, the administration of the system transitions from entrepreneurs and engineers to managers. Organizations become more and more risk-averse. Taking chances tends to be punished. Debate ensues about who captures the rents of this mature system, capital or labor, rather than how to grow the system. This chapter examines the management of mature systems and suggests strategies for coping. Readers are encouraged to observe the world and judge for themselves. 18.2 Increases in productivity diminish or vanish as systems mature. Processes running prior to the maturing of a system run down, in a sense, as a system matures. Early on, the predominant technology is established, technological and institutional structure. Emphasis then is on the components of systems, first on the hard and then on the process technologies. The easy things get done first and diminishing returns set in. So one characteristic of mature systems is the great difficulty of achieving productivity improvements. To obtain economies of scale, it's very desirable to have a standardized product, which is needed for production efficiency. It's risky to vary that product because economies of scale may be lost if unsuccessful. 18.3. Escape, adapt, accept are the three basic strategies for organizations at maturity. There are three basic strategies for dealing with maturity which map to Hirschman's 1970 Exit Voice and Loyalty. Strategy 1. Escape. Reject the predominant system structure as given and instead invest in research and development, R&D. Explore systems options and markets so as to continually renew or break away from the tyranny of the life cycle. This should be a continuing effort so that new directions of development are available as the system passes its halfway point in deployment and the rate of growth begins to slow. Instead of having development and then growth to maturity, we seek development, growth, and renewal of development, growth, and so on. This strategy is becoming popular in the management literature to Christensen's 1997 The Innovator's Dilemma and the success of Apple Computer in the early 2000s. Christensen argues the leading firms can stay on top so long as innovations are not disruptive but an innovation that changes the core technology, particularly one that significantly reduces cost for the task at hand and is technologically good enough, even if not as capable as the mature product, upsets the mature firms in the industry. If a competitive product is invading the market, for example, steam versus sailing ships, buses versus streetcars, then managers may invest in research and development to try to produce that product or buy a successful producer of the new product, for example, railroads buying trucking companies. Strategy 2. Adapt. Suppose there is a situation where new producers invade the market with similar products offering higher quality or lower cost. That's the situation in numerous product lines as trade and competition have been internationalized. Managers seek to imitate lower cost producers and or dampen international competition via tariffs and quotas. An example is in airlines where the larger network carriers United, Delta, American are threatened by low cost carriers using a different model, for example Southwest or JetBlue. Larger carriers then try to restructure themselves in imitation. Managers in this case often have exhausted most sources for productivity improvements as a competitive edge. Mature system managers increasingly fine-tune services or products to markets, and getting the scale economies just right is essential. Airlines, for instance, try to price discriminate very carefully. People in adjacent seats may have paid thousands of dollars difference in fares, and aim to ensure a high load factor as an empty seat is permanently lost revenue. Strategy 3. Accept. In general, the manager's tasks are to know the environment within which the organization is operating and the status of the organization. With that knowledge, the manager should take steps to appropriate the situation, that is, do the best one can strategy. It accepts the life cycle and maturity is inescapable. Suppose producers are in a monopolistic or nearly so situation and competitors are not so much a problem. The firm or organization may be used as a cash cow to support taking up other endeavors that have more potential for growth. The cash cow may be spun off to raise money for other ventures. 
That has happened in several rail cases. Through institutional reorganization, railroads have been stripped of their more promising holdings, for example, land, pipeline, and communications and information systems companies. In a sense, the railroad cash cow is used by the company to create new cash cows that they, can then, that they then lost control of. Often competing products are attacked as antisocial and management behavior appears complacent. Quote, the steam vessel was not a school of steam, seamanship for officers or men. Lounging through the watches of a steam or acting as firemen or coal heavers will not produce in a seaman the combination of boldness, strength, and skill which characterized an American sailor of an earlier day. In the habitual exercise by an officer of a command, the execution of which is not under his own eye, is a poor substitute for the school of observation, promptness, and command found only on the deck of a sailing vessel. Morrison, Men Machine in Modern Times Ergo, steamships are evil. On the other hand, there is nothing like a sailboat to teach aspiring mariners the power of nature, and both the U.S. Coast Guard and Naval Academy still maintain sailboats for training. 18.4. Obduracy is standard practice in mature organizations. Firms may combine strategies. Different parts of firms may engage in different strategies. In general, the mature unit becomes the sacrificial cash cow, which is milked for cash and starved for new investment. That cash is reinvested elsewhere within the organization to grow new technologies and markets or outside as the firm takes its profits and buys other organizations, buys research and development, or returns cash to investors as dividends so they may invest elsewhere. We are sorry to say that the notion that managers should take early action in the anticipation of eventual maturity has a just words character. There is much talk about strategic management, but little practice. For instance, it has often been said that the railroads should have thought of themselves as transportation companies much sooner. Redefining your mission may be a way out of an unprofitable industry. However, until deregulation, the railroads were prohibited from such redefinition. Once deregulation took place, the redefinition soon followed. U.S. railroads invested in moving companies, barge lines, and international shipping, among other related businesses in the 1980s. They divested them a decade later. We've said that managers are in general risk-adverse, mainly because having the scale just right is so important. Risks exist if the scale doesn't work out correctly. Some managers, knowing their situation and the resources held or obtainable, engage in strategic planning and actions to reconfigure the organization for new developments. We typically see that change in mature organizations is scarce, that is, except as the most widely adopted strategy. The difficulties of changes have been called obduracy by Hommels, who identifies three underlying causes. Dominant frames, constrained ways of thinking and interacting, especially in design, embeddedness, close interconnectedness of social and technical elements, and persistent traditions, long-term persistence of traditions. All three factors have a role to play. Those who study the evolution of technology have developed several different theories to look at technological systems. These theories are in part contradictory and part complementary. Some major ones are listed below. Social construction of technology, Scott, suggests that human action shapes technology but not vice versa. It is associated with the work of Thomas Hughes and others. Our experiential policy model, described in Chapter 31, implies that human action shapes technology but that technology and the environment are also shape human action. There's physical evidence for transportation technology and the environment shaping human action, and that is the study of the brains of London taxi drivers. London taxi drivers are required to have what is called the knowledge before getting licensed, which allows them to deliver, deliver travelers safely to any location in London without consulting a map. The knowledge has been required since 1865, and typical drivers practice for 34 months and take the test 12 times before passing. It has been shown that the hippocampus, the part of the brain associated with navigation, is larger for London cabbies than the average person. Actor network theory, ANT, descriptively examines the relationship between actors, including both humans and the technologies. The relationships, the network, are both material, between things, and semiotic, between ideas. It is associated with the work of Bruno Latour, who in one book describes the development of a personal rapid transit system proposed for Paris. Large Technical Systems, LTS, is a building block theory, which argues that systems are built upon systems in a cumulative, hierarchical way. Thomas Hughes discusses large technical systems like the Big Dig. We discuss this in section 18.7. We need to mention another matter that holds for all managers, the effort to pro product differentiate. The hallmarks of maturity are product standardization and market saturation. Despite market saturation, the size of market may be growing, for example, as population grows, steady or falling, for example, if a competitive product is invading the market. 
To maintain market share in such situations, managers attempt to differentiate their product and mine out market niches. Confrontation results between the desire for standardization and the desire for differentiation. The result is that we get standardized product that may come in many colors with, with or without fancy features and so on. With maturity, then comes product variety. Even though the product is quite standardized, we see this clearly in the automobile market. 18.5. The behavior of the system is conditioned by its structure. Air, transit, and highway systems compare across a number of attributes. The word system or mode does not fit any of the systems very well. We noted the truck highway and auto highway systems. For air, there are commercial and private aviation systems and freight versus passenger systems. Transit has at least the varieties of suburban, rail, bus, and elevated subway. Often diversity is ignored in policy debates. Diversity is suggestive of ways systems might change. It is also the reason for the distortions created by one-size-fits-all policies. One way to recognize the problems of the air system is to see them as a result of force-fitting. That occurred partly when the system in the United States grasped the opportunity to use post-World War II former military airports. The commercial part of the system had been forced to work out of those airports. Coerced might be a better word than forced. The few major new airports that have been built have duplicated the World War II airports in important ways. The big force-fitting was the introduction of the jet into the DC-3 system. The jet forced scale changes in non-equipment components of the system. In ways the horse-powered highway system have a parallel to the DC-3, and the motorized systems were force-fit as the jet was. Trucks and autos operate on streets built before motorization and on facilities built later, but which carry over pre-motorization protocols. Bus transit is in that situation too. The berthing of rail had more a put together in a new form to fit a function character, and rail mass transit grew from such beginnings. We have stressed how, once the structure of a system gets established, the behavior of the system is conditioned by its structure. Indeed, behavior reinforces structure. We have stressed how the exploration of new functional forms is thwarted, remarking mainly on limitations on the explorations of technology options and markets. One way to state the urban transportation problem is to say that the systems available do not fit their environment well. That's because the environment has changed, and importantly, perceptions of how environments ought to be have changed. Although there are several aspects to this, a simple statement to illustrate the point is to say that in the United States, the urban market is not dense enough for transit and it is too dense for autos. A desirable property for systems is the capability to adapt to changes in their environments. In ways, transit systems have adapted better to changes in the urban environment than the auto system. The adoption of the bus in the 1920s through the 1950s in the recent Development of paratransit services are examples of changes responsive to the environment. Following a point we made in Chapter 10, we have stressed the locked-in character of the systems and their consequential inability to continue to improve what they do. The present point is that locking in thwarts systems' abilities to adapt as their environments change. Structure and behavior condition rules are permissive of two classes of system-improving actions. These are actions seeking the economies of networking and actions seeking route economies of scale. The two classes interact. The articulation of services over a network permits achieving economies of scale on routes on that network. The efficiencies to be achieved via route economies of scale may motivate networking. Considered alone, the improvements from networking seem to be mainly service improvements. Trucking organizations that operate nationally have costs similar to those of regional operators, but they offer better service for long-distance movements. It's nice to have a networked international air system, one can travel the world with a single booking and ticket. Airplanes can be repaired almost anywhere, and traffic rules are universal. The low cost of networking results from the use of unitary technologies and the standards required by such technologies. Standards, the work change, and the fitting of systems to local conditions. Route economies of scale are often captured by upscaling equipment. If demand exists for a route, larger airplanes, longer passenger trains, or larger buses may be used. Commodities may be moved in unit trains, large tows, or large ships, such as very large crude carriers, VLCCs. In addition to capturing equipment, related cost reductions, the transportation providing organization may also achieve cost reductions in passenger processing, managing, and so on. Movement cost may be lowered, but the queues may be longer. One waits longer, say, for a larger, lower per unit cost aircraft. Just as the freeway system has enabled sharp provision of facility route economies for, law, for highway departments, hub-and-spoke traffic patterns concentrate traffic so that route economies of scale may be achieved. 
The point we wish to make is that these scale and network economies achieve service improvements or cost reductions, but also have costs associated with them. 18.6. Spandrels create hooks for innovation. The spandrel is the approximately triangular space between the exterior curve of an arch and the rectangular framework around it. It is not intentional, but rather a necessary result. Architects have taken advantage of the opportunity of the spandrel to provide space for decoration. Gould and Lewinton, 1979, have used the term as a metaphor to describe how certain features evolve, noting that not every feature exists for a purpose when it was created. In a similar way, transportation systems produce spandrels all of the time. In the most direct analogy, the space inside a highway cloverleaf is a spandrel most often used for landscaping, but doesn't serve a transportation purpose. These spaces can be later exploited, for example as a park and ride lot or a water detention pond. Innovation can take advantage of spandrels, hooks created by the existing design, to attach new services. Another example is the use of runways at night by freight cargo services. Runways cannot just be rolled up when they aren't being used, taking advantage of this temporal spandrel, Federal Express launched an overnight delivery service. See section 20.4. 18.7. Consequential developments occur in second-order systems. With transportation systems largely in place, we have inquired, invented, and innovated. Priority goes to questions about their reconfiguring, redesign, and re-energizing. How do we improve services and adjust to changing conditions? Here is some jargon bearing on structure that may help us understand what we are doing and what we might do. Think of large technical systems, LTS, and transportation systems in particular, as first-order systems recognizable because of their common characteristics and behaviors. Characteristics include their unitary technologies and products. Services are produced the same way everywhere and products are the same everywhere. One size fits all. The systems are used for many purposes. Extending Let's recognize second-order systems. In contrast to LTS that have homogeneous technologies and services yet serve diverse pop purposes, second-order systems are highly specialized and have heterogeneous technologies. They are formed by merging or combining aspects of LTS and other systems. An example of a second-order system is the U.S. Nitrogen Fertilizer Production and Delivery System. It is built from fertilizer production technologies as well as institutional and financial technologies. It combines or configures those with transportation and communications technologies in a very specialized and precise way. Communications and information systems play an important role. Fertilizer delivery in wet or dry forms, depending largely on soil wetness, which varies market to market and year to year, by barge, rail, and truck service combinations, arrives precisely when needed for the spring plowing season. First order systems are made up of building blocks. With respect to transportation systems, we have referred to components, fixed facilities, equipment, and operations, and have emphasized that these involve both hard and soft ways of doing things. In the jargon proposed here, think of components as zero-order systems. We would say that highway delivery system made up of contractors, tax collectors, state and local agencies, and so on, is a zero-order system. What does this notion of second-order systems do for us? Is the jargon useful? Let's consider transportation improvements. We strive to improve transportation for many reasons. Most people target zeroth order systems for improvement, operations, traffic flow, bridge structures, insurance arrangements, and so forth. Scoping to systems seen as first order systems is rare, and second order systems aren't considered at all. Does this observation help us understand improvements achieved and not achieved? In addressing that question, instrumental and consequential are operative words. With respect to instrumental improvements, those that can change things, we must be sensitive to development and growth dynamics. Relatively mature systems are not very responsive to improvements in zeroth order systems, and such improvements are thus not very consequential. Even though we are surrounded by mature systems, there are some things at first order levels that might make a difference. The list includes achieving scale economies, reducing costs, and expanding territory using networking technologies. Today, such technologies, largely soft, are needed in response to NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the integration of Europe, emergence of developing and newly developed countries, and the increasing globalization of industry and commerce. Boundary conditions change, such as those supported by deregulation and imposed by energy and environmental considerations. We might seek to make systems more supple by specializing services and or introducing new technologies. One is load leveling, such as that sought by airline fare schemes, congestion pricing, and flex time. These examples of ways to reconfigure apply to all LTS. Of these, making systems more supple seems most interesting because suppleness might be instrumental in triggering consequential second-order system development. 
where consequential implies improving matters by at least an order of two, where history seems to say magnitudes of that sort are needed to change things. The social uses of transportation are in second order system activities, of course. So if we are to find consequential developments, that's where we will find them. Is the jargon useful? Does it help us understand the following dialogue? Technologists seeking first order system improvement. Increasing highway system capacity using intelligent transportation system techniques will increase consumer surplus. Critic interested in making life better. What's that going to do for us? Consumer surplus is the economist's fairy gold. Will the second order system things that are important to me and involve transportation work better? By giving attention to second order systems, one should be able to get a sense of desirable directions of development of LTS. Clearly, we like the jargon. We think. It provides interpretations of companion innovation and intermodal notions. It links communications and transportation in rich ways. It enriches understandings of the functions of LTS. 18.8. Government policies for maturity are negotiated contracts with the regulated. We think that as systems mature, bloom off the rose changes in public attitudes force systems to develop policies responding to the interest of diverse and not always friendly publics. As systems mature, more and more attention is given to problems that embedded policies do not handle well. Although the division is not always neat, government policies can be divided into those that apply to activities generally, general policies, and to those that are activity or mode specific, modal policies. The former have increased in number greatly in recent decades, as has the balance between the activities of state and local governments versus the federal government. Sometimes general policies are given a special twist when applied to the modes. It seems useful to think of mode-specific policies as contracts. The policies are adopted as parties to the contract give and take and agree on a course of action. Much of the policy action in the decades since the railroads began to mature, for example, can be thought of as efforts to modify policies, contracts, as things change, the reinterpretation of policies as the relative powers of the parties to contracts change, and the reinterpretation of contracts as social and economic values and views change. Turning to the agencies that manage policy, agencies seem to go through a kind of life cycle. Early, they are full of vim and vigor. Later, they are dominated by bureaucratic and procedural matters, and they may be immobilized by inability to deal with conflicting demands. The reversal of policies in which much has been invested is difficult. This was the case for the ICC. An asymmetric information problem evolved. Hayek's fatal conceit teaches that agencies cannot have as much information as held by those for whom policies are made. This forces agencies to regulate in a broad brush way, one policy fits all cases, and to miss or misread broad industry trends. This seems to hold in the rail case. On the other hand, policies are responsive to broad changes in public attitudes and values, as expressed by legislators. In the rail case, the agency has been responsive to social costs, safety, labor, free enterprise, and monopoly issues as they have unfolded. However, the conflicts caused by agencies responding to many drummers are not well treated within agencies. Government policies strive to handle problems that embedded within corporation policies could not handle well. Government has been responsible for conflicts between and within other modes. Air traffic control is a government agency or government authorized company in most countries. While it works in general in that planes rarely collide midair, it has been criticized for being too conservative in policy resulting in congestion and too backward in technology resulting in safety problems. In the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration has been regularly lambasted for its difficulty in upgrading computer systems. The criticism reached a peak with the 1981 air traffic controller strike. For an overview of rail labor issues, see section 13.5. Yet the problems were very slow to be solved. Newt Gingrich, an American politician, would routinely pull out a vacuum tube as a prop describing the state of FAA computers well into the 1990s, when private industry had long been using solid-state electronics. Similarly, railroad-to-railroad -railroad problems were at the interface of the railroads and users. These seemed to have been handled fairly well, and by the 1920s, the deeper problem of the have-and-have-not railroads began to get attention. Government policies did not handle these latter problems well. Instead, changes in markets, opportunities for institutional improvements, and changes in technological tools were recognized by the railroads and yielded policies about car handling, traffic concentration, and network design and operations that government policy seemed to thwart. Mergers and acquisitions were essential to realizations of these embedded policies, and government policies were not strongly supportive of mergers and acquisitions, though they permitted them subject to conditions. 18.9 
Large system innovations are the work of blind giants. The term blind giants used by Paul David, an economic historian at Stanford, has two aspects. We call them giants because it takes a giant to create something big, and blind because the giant cannot possibly know the consequences of actions and how a system will grow and develop. Large infrastructure networks tend to be built and managed by these blind giants. Certainly, they may start small, but to deliver transnational transportation requires a transnational organization. Large organizations can arrange financing and supporting systems to deploy large networks quickly by exploiting existing economies of scale. Rational analysis can aid blind giants in only limited ways. It goes without saying that we would like to improve innovation processes. Does rational analysis get in the way? How might it be helpful? Those are good questions and we can only speculate about them. As mentioned, Smeaton was very much a rational analyst. He took the steam engine as a given and applied his rational linear thinking to improve it. That contrasts with a more integrative approach taken by Stevenson and Pease and Fulton. Another case was the analysis Brunel applied to the Great Eastern. In the development of container liner services, both Malcolm McLean and Matson Navigation Company used integrative approaches. But Matson's was backed up by considerable analysis. Did analysis provide risk information that dampened Matson's entrepreneurial efforts? Does too much analysis provide excuses for limited action? Should we conclude that rational analysis has great strengths if the task is to improve an existing system and integrative analysis has its advantages elsewhere? Pacey addresses the rational linear analysis versus integrative design thinking issue and concludes that integrative thinking breeds innovations. However, we consider this is not an either-or issue for the ways of thinking might be complementary. Consider Brunel in the Great Eastern again. Brunel thought widely and then took advantage of analysis. As we see, integrative thinking may run the risk of not using enough analysis to bound feasible spaces. It may generate ideas that won't work because the numbers don't add. Rational analysis may conclude something won't work because of inability to consider possibilities. With a little innovation, steering became a non-problem. The race goes to the first off the starting line, and not necessarily to the swiftest. We imagine a blind giant who is unable to imagine the future and understand the consequence of actions. That wouldn't be much of a problem if trial and error were disciplined by the tooth and claw of the marketplace. Put another way, if pure evolutionary processes were at work. That is not the case, for blind giant decisions are subject to strong lock-in because of networking requirements. Lock-in can occur in several ways. If one choice is as good as another in situations, tipping may occur. It just happens that when things went a certain way, others then saw that they were better off if they went that way too. The choice of driving on the left or right side of the street may be an example. Such a choice may be pushed by regulation and it may force acceptance of second best. That's the case of TV standards in the United States and Japan, and TSC, which for decades yielded an inferior picture to the standards PAL and CCAM adopted in Europe. Why did the beta format give way to VHS and video cassette recorders? Video rental stores certainly disliked having to stock two formats and were quick to jump on the bandwagon when VHS market shares marched ahead. In the early days of systems, there are rapid performance improvements, operating know-how, hard technologies, and so on. As the market begins to grow, economies of scale begin to be achieved. Pressures for standardization emerge in order to support production efficiencies, for example, standardized employee uniforms and operating protocols, and also to support efficiencies to be gained by networking. The length of time the window is open for changes is small. Once the window is closed, it is hard to reopen even if something better comes along. After lock-in moots an option, it is often forgotten. Perhaps the most costly result of lock-in is that it is unrecognized. It is assumed that pure evolutionary or competitive forces have been at play and what we have are optimal systems. So people put priority on perfecting suboptimal designs, doing the thing right instead of doing the right thing. A quite different cost is this. Some assume that lock-in is so tight that change is unthinkable. History says that's nonsense. We can recall, for example, that it was the reason that jet aircraft would never have other than military uses. Limits on cognition and personal energy translate into professionals viewing the set of possible transportation systems and the set of existing systems as the same. Professionals rarely think of new ways in which transportation services might be provided or ways that existing systems might be sharply altered. We find what might have been a stimulus to wider thinking and suggestive alternatives. Around the 1850s, there was much discussion of appropriate rail gauge, and in the late 19th century, it was thought that dual systems of narrow gauge and wide gauge made sense. 
This is one of many suggestive what might have beens lost in the dust of history, so to speak. What mechanisms are operating? First is pure chance. For example, Bridgewater died. It just happened that road owners didn't like steam vehicles. Stevenson selected Roman cart gauge for his railroad. The list is very long. But pure chance doesn't take us very far unless there are some strong mechanisms that lock in the results of pure chance. One easy-to-see mechanism is returns to scale. Other processes are at work to reinforce the increasing returns. Increasing returns from scale and scope economies are common in transportation, and as Marshall emphasized, things get locked in by the presence of monopolies. They also get locked in by the development of standards. So a new alternative might become an impossible choice because it doesn't meet the standard. For instance, today's standards call for multi-purpose trucks and auto highways and lock-in vehicle types. Other processes yield increasing returns with time. Technology and institutional improvements are focused on the choice made. The steam engine was developed rapidly for use on trains. It wasn't developed very much for use in on-road vehicles. Learning increases efficiency. Limits on our cognition exist. The returns that matter are in what transportation does that is worth society doing. We would never learn about returns of an alternative, unpursued technology. They are outside our cognition. Turning away from increasing returns, consider now changes in consumer expectations. An example may help. When the auto was first innovated, its early use was for social travel, so big cars were built. Standards were put in place for big cars and roads for them. We learned how to produce big cars efficiently. Today, cars are used for all kinds of specialized things. Often, as in the journey to work, a one-passenger car would do. That's an example of the processes that the idea of the change in expectation strives to catch. Changes in environments or situations need to be considered. Once the technology is honed and occupies the turf and limits our cognition, there is no room for an alternative. 18.10. Maturity creates imperatives. The word imperative often enters the discussion of transportation, energy, and the environment. In highway transportation, there are imperatives to keep vehicle producers healthy, find the money to fix the road system, decrease congestion, as well as to increase safety, clean the air, and achieve energy independence. All these imperatives are treating symptoms of the maturity dysfunction rather than maturity itself. What policies are needed to treat the maturity dysfunction? Insights to the answers to that question are aided by the birthing experiences we will review. Experiences for railroads, inland and coastal transport, steam, metal, ship, marine transport, and the auto truck highway system. Birthing is based on the old, yet often incorporates something new. System design is the process, and a new system design is the product. Market niches are involved. Sometimes a few actors are involved, for example, Stevenson and Peace. In other cases, it is a many-actor situation, the auto truck highway experience. The systems birthed successfully are consistent with economic and social trajectories of development. They do old things as well as new things, though often the new is discovered after a system is birthed. Most experience is with incremental innovations applied to an existing system. Experience of the strategies of adapt and accept. Conventional views of innovation as well as policies to support innovative activities are based on that experience. It is judged that the policies needed should speed up technology development and its diffusion. Policies should apply to advanced technology, there is little appreciation of the need for policies that support new departures or new designs. The inability to obtain patents may be a problem. Modifications to existing designs may be thwarted by standards. The system birthing experiences each had to overcome barriers. They did so largely because their high payoffs pushed barriers aside. The call for new system designs in market niches brings the response, we have tried that using demonstration projects. The experience with them has been largely unsuccessful. What needs to be different from present practice? For one thing, a large percentage of demonstration projects are just schemes for attracting funding. Congressmen arrange projects for their districts. Many projects have a technology transfer character. Where something new is involved, risk of failure may limit the richness of demonstrations. Maturity creates imperatives. Managers must tactically manage the existing system, but they must also strategically seek new opportunities, innovating in new markets. 18.11. 18.11. Maturity creates opportunities. We have used the words stressful and consequential, and such words are subject to interpretation. We meant them to be interpreted in very limited ways. An intervention was successful if there was a result that would not have otherwise occurred. It was consequential if the monetary and service results had non-trivial impacts. Now we have the word non-trivial to interpret, but we will not. 
experience says that improvements are forged by taking what we have and carrying out new combinations. Schumpeter, 1934. The designs, new combinations, that seed new development pathways are built from old stuff in the beginning. The auto highway system, for example, built from existing highway facilities, wagon, bicycle, and buggy equipment, and electric motor or steam, auto cycle or diesel engines, and know-how about the uses of transportation for passenger and freight purposes. The system also interfaced constructively with rail systems. It dealt with social, economic, and ecological problems of the day. Its deployment became an imperative, an imperative strong enough to break existing social contracts forming barriers to deployment. There are many opportunities to produce new stuff, which could be the old stuff in the forging of new combinations or departures. Going beyond that, it suggests that we should be alert to the opportunities. While history underscores inevitability, it also tells us how to break the inevitability of the life cycle. We know that the instrument of choice for the intervention in the life cycle should be technology. We have noted that technology is the major force for change. History certainly tells us that. Indeed, as we examine transit, the search for improved air quality and energy conservation efforts, we will see that technology was one tool for planning. We will also see that knowing that technology is the tool to be used is not enough. One must know how to make technology work. Setting aside issues such as market control by large suppliers, one cannot disagree in principle with deregulation, pricing, and for that matter, other prescriptions for achieving economic efficiency in mature systems. Nonetheless, it must be recognized that the priority given these popular topics comes with opportunity costs. Other opportunities receive low priority. New ways of using technology, reducing the costs of labor, and reworking embedded policies may well have been more important to improved railroad efficiency than deregulation. What's the overall bottom line for mode-specific policies? Reconsider the quotation opening the chapter. Perhaps it should be rewritten. The combination of highly permanent policies or contracts, lack of realism in their conception, and difficulty of revising them is one of the worst legacies our time is leaving to posterity. As a mode matures, new policies are needed. We are probably better off with new policies than without them. We would probably be better off with less permanence, more realism, and an improved ability to revise obsolete dysfunctional policies. Maturity creates opportunities. One can identify at a general level things to try out and things to avoid when working with mature systems. One might work toward a set of rules. Tune products to markets and specialized services. Shun standardized one-size-fits-all design. Plan to achieve economies of scale. Many cost-reducing actions have already been mined out, and something new or something revised has to compete where turf is already occupied. Avoid high capital cost projects that will require high volume use to cover capital costs. Recognize that managers are risk averse, emphasize tried and true solutions to problems. Exploit the cash cows and fat cows that cover the landscape. Downsizing and changing money flows are options. This is a sample from a possible larger set of rules. Note that what to avoid and what to do is sometimes left implicit. 18.12 transportation is possessed with zombies. In transportation, nothing ever truly dies as long as the line on the map is a memory in the mind of an advocate. The decision to not build a project is easily reversed, since no involves no investment in fixed costs, unless something is done in its stead. This is especially a problem if the right-of-way for the facility is being preserved, through either land purchases or prohibitions on development. We might call these old ideas zombie transportation, projects that are now bad or at least no longer good ideas, effectively seemingly dead, yet still alive in people's minds. Occasionally, like the California High-Speed Rail Project, zombies get partial funding before their plug is eventually pulled. There are lots of other projects one can think of that were lines on maps for decades before being realized. Outer Beltway sections of Maryland 200, the Intercounty Connector, and Minnesota 610 are two that come immediately to mind on the map for 60 and at least 40 years, respectively. In many cases, the problem is simple. Ruthless benefit-cost analysis, the BC ratio, which may have once been above 1.0, falls to a lower level due to changed circumstances, increased costs due to environmental or other concerns, or a change in demand associated with different finance mechanisms or price of energy. Yet, because it is a commitment, political or moral, to a community that their turn will come up, they too will get their line built. The line on the map never comes off the map. Once a project is completed and open, it is essentially irreversible. Few facilities are shuttered before they physically fail. A few exceptions to be noted, ex for example, anticipating collapse, some urban freeways in San Francisco have been removed. 
or require replacement, streetcars in many U.S. cities in the mid-20th century. And even then, many facilities which should be shuttered continued to be maintained and operated, and later reconstructed instead. The difficulty of implementing gravelization, which may be effective for low-volume roads, is an extreme example of this. We need a better system for truly killing bad or obsolete ideas in transportation, for culling the losers or the no longer winners. Otherwise, agencies will look at decade-old maps say to themselves what remains unfinished and proceed along to build zombie facilities despite newer priorities rising to the fore and old ideas ceasing to be effective. Some like aging systems. They provide a certain stability of career paths, social interrelation, and cash flow. Those are on-system attributes. Off-system, they have a stabilizing effect. Jim Mills, one-time president pro tem of the California State Senate and promoter of rail in San Diego, said that rail was much better than bus service because it did not change easily compared to bus. That is, the great feature of bus, its flexibility, is also its weakness, lack of permanence. We counter by simply noting that while streetcars disappeared from urban streets more than half a century ago, almost all those routes have continuing transit service. So while the infrastructure may change, the service sticks.